It's finally time, everybody, for my first Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous class guide. I don't know exactly what to call this. This is going to be a guide on how to level up a character and get you through the very early game in Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous on unfair difficulty. I will preface this by saying, of course, this build works on the lower difficulties, but you don't need to go through all the hoops and stuff that you need to go on upper difficulty. You can goof around a little bit more on the easier difficulties, and you don't need to follow this guide as strictly if you're playing this on an easier difficulty. So, with that out of the way, we're going to create a Sohei Monk Vivisectionist Blood Rider, which I think is the strongest combo that you can do right now, level 3 combo that is uh, currently in the game. So, let's just jump into it and I'm gonna talk you through it, how to create this character, why it works so great, and uh, yeah, let's have a look. So, here we are creating a character, I've just selected a portrait, I'm gonna go to class. Uh, we're gonna start off as a Monk Sohei. Uh, and I'm, hopefully I will show you some footage here of why we're starting off with Sohei, because Sohei, we, we don't really need all the monk stuff really on this character. Why we're going with this is of course that we get the monk bonus feat, and the Sohei can select a mounted bonus feat, which means that they can forego the requirement of having to pick up uh, mounted combat before they select a mounted feat, which means that they can go immediately to Spirited Charge, which is the... Uh, best feat probably in the game right now in terms of damage because it doubles your charge damage. Of course Sohei gives you a lot of other stuffs. For instance it gives you Flurry of Blows. Flurry of Blows means that whenever you attack something, if you attack with a monk weapon or if you attack unarmed you will get an extra attack at your highest attack bonus. This is useful but we're not going to use that for the charge attack because we want the charge attack to deal a maximum amount of damage and we're not going to do that with our fists. It's usually going to be better to do something like a scythe which has a times 4 critical multiplier which is also very very good when you reload a lot which you tend to do on unfair difficulty. So uh, you get unarmed strike as I said we're not going to use that too much. Uh, monastic mount we're not going to care about. We get the animal companions very very important. We get to pick up a steed. We get to pick up the horse. If you want to go with some other mount, you can do this, but it's a little bit more roundabout. You need to uh, go mounted combat then on another class, and then you need to have a small character, uh, like a gnome or a halfling or something like that. And then of course you can build pretty much the same thing. This spirited charge is not locked behind being a monk. You can of course uh, get to that by other means if you want to. So that is the thing we're going to go with. We're going to go with Sohei Monk, and for race, you can go pretty much anything, it doesn't really matter that much. I think you will have a little bit of an easier time on unfair difficulty if you go with Dampir, so that you have negative energy affinity, which means that you don't take damage from negative energy. There's a lot of uh, like evil clerics channeling negative energy in the early game, so picking this up will help you a lot. Resist level drain, when you transition at least to in Act 2, you will encounter level drains, and being uh, immune to it essentially. It's very, very good. Keep in mind though that if you go with Damper, you need to have some character which can heal with negative energy, because you can't heal with normal healing spells if you go with this uh, particular option right here. I'm gonna go with Damper. Then I'm going to select Young Sheborn. It's essentially because we get a plus two racial bonus strength. You can go with any racial which gives you a plus two bonus strength. Nothing else is really that important for the build. That won't work without it. For the background selection, there's a lot of good options. One of them could be, for instance, Pickpocket, where you get a little bit of extra, uh, extra bonus on stealth. You add them as class skills, and you get a plus two bonus to initiative rolls. Can be a nice thing. You don't need initiative rolls that often. It's going to be useful when you go into turn-based mode, and sometimes it's actually very, very good to start off in normal mode, and then you charge in, and mid-charge, or when you've charged in and dealt the initial uh, chunk of damage, you can often switch into turn-based mode, and then it can be a little bit beneficial to have uh, both as an initiative roll. Another good thing can be the Wanderer Nomad, where you most notably get a plus 3 bonus to maximum hit points on your animal companion, which sometimes can be enough to save them, but keep in mind that on unfair difficulty everything deals twice the damage, which means that in most cases every enemy is both going to hit you and they're going to deal more damage than your animal companion has health, at least in the very very early game. And that's another solid option. We're gonna go with Nomad, just for the time being. Uh, so, for the stats, you need to max out strength for this build. You don't need any dexterity. Dexterity does almost nothing for you. 
It, this does give you a little bit of initiative, it does give you AC, but since you're mounted, you will essentially never be targeted. Especially in the early game, you will never be targeted by any enemy when you're mounted. So having the dexterity is a little bit redundant. Of course, you can use this for feats later on, but with the strategy that we're going for today, you don't need to. I know that this adds, of course, to your mobility, and if you have a bad mobility, and you go for mm, combat feats to protect your mount, uh, you're not going to be able to do that. But on the other hand, it won't be that good on upper difficulty. <laughs> Believe me. So in this, instead, what we're going to go with is we're going to dump charisma also. We're going to go up uh, to about 14 or 16. Ah, uh, 14 constitution. <laughs> because this is the exact uh, stats that I went for in my playthrough. Hopefully I will list or link down below the playthrough where I played with these characters. So you can check that out for yourself and see how these characters perform. Uh, so why are we adding Constitution? Constitution is because we're going to add Blood Rider later on, and we want to have as high of a modifier as possible. It's also nice because to add our hit points, of course. And having a high modifier is going to make it so that we can Blood Rage for as long as possible. We're going to talk about Blood Rider when we get to that level. Uh, intelligence is because we're going to go with a Vivisectionist. <laughs> I need to say that in a Russian voice because it suits better. Um, the Vivisectionist, of course, use intelligence as the spell casting thing, and it also sometimes it's useful to qualify for certain um, combat speeds. Uh, we have a little bit of wisdom. We are not going to have that much wisdom, but later on in the game, of course, we can pick up equipment, which gives us plus to wisdom, and of course, we get our wisdom bonus added to our AC since we are a monk, as long as we're not wearing armor. That is. Next, we're gonna go to skills. Here you can select a little bit what you want, essentially. I'm gonna go for stealth. Uh, sometimes low religion is kind of useful. Uh, this, of course, low religion makes it so that you don't uh, can avoid getting corrupted when you camp and stuff like that. But the saves are very, very high and upper difficulty, so you're very rarely, even if you max out your low religion, uh, you're very rarely gonna pass those anyways. Then, as I said, you can go with essentially anything. Uh, so I'm just going to select some random things here. Of course, perception is very good, but perception is more important to put on your animal companions. Um, because everybody, of course, gets a perception roll for everything where you have a chance to find something. So, next up is the feet. The feet... Oh, it's almost always going to be boom companion. Uh, because next level we are going to select another class, and that class will not have an animal companion. If you select boon companion, that means that the character level of your animal companion will still rise, even though you level up a with a multi-class with another class which doesn't have an animal companion. But it can only do that for uh, four levels. So you can you can multi-class a little bit. You can t pick up a couple of other classes with your animal companion, uh, but uh, you can't pick up too many. You can't pick up more than four, uh, else you will. Else your animal command will start lagging behind a little bit in efficiency. And strength and everything. Uh, of course, for the monk feat, we're going to go with Spirited Charge. Where we deal double damage with melee weapons when we charge. This is very, very important, and this is how we get through the early game. Um, yeah, let's go to gods here. What do we select for the deity? There's no wrong choice here. I would maybe go Shaleen. <laughs> There's no, like, it gives you a lot of options for multi-classing. Because we can go into Lawful Good, and Lawful Good is the most flexible class when it comes to, or the most flexible uh, alignment when it comes to multi-classing. Because we can go into Paladin, uh, of course Monk is fine. The only thing we cannot go with Lawful Good is we cannot go, uh, let's see here, Barbarian. Barbarian needs to be non-lawful. So that will not work out. Uh, okay. Follow if you dare. And now uh, we'll just select a random voice, a random name, doesn't matter. Flesh wound. Complete. Next we are gonna level up this character. And next level, what we're gonna go for is the Alchemist Vivisectionist. So you're gonna pick up this level right when you pass the very, very tutorial area. When you get to the Mongol village, you're gonna go pick up Vivisectionist. So up until that point, your character will not be super good, you will have trouble hitting stuff. But you need to go level 2 Vivisectionist, because of course Vivisectionist can cast spells, and one of the spells that you will be able to cast then, uh, I'm gonna show you that in just one second, is going to be... Uh, sure, whatever. 
is going to be True Strike. True Strike is the most important spell for this build. True Strike gives you a plus 20 insight bonus on your next attack, which is going to be a charge, and of course you're gonna get double damage on your charge. So what you're gonna do is, of course, you're gonna have your characters, everybody in stealth, you're gonna cast True Strike on everybody, uh, I really recommend that you hotkey this thing, so that you <laughs> don't have to click too much with the mouse, because that's gonna, you know, tire out your mouse hand or something. So, you cast True Strike on everybody, then you go out of stealth, while the game is paused, and everybody has the True Strike buff on them, and you click out the charges on everybody. I recommend that you key behind this also. <laughs> you charge everything, and then you're gonna hit, and you're gonna deal double damage. And from that point on, the game should be much, much easier than it was before. Uh, you do that before every battle, and you're gonna have two true strikes, and whenever you use those two true strikes, you're gonna have to rest to get them back. Unfortunately. For the other spells, it doesn't matter too much, because you're not gonna use them really in the early game. Uh, my favorite selections after that would be probably Expeditious Treat, has a lot of use cases. Shield is kind of nice, a large person can make you deal more damage, but you never want to dismount from your animal companions, so you're never gonna use the enlarged person. Otherwise, it'd be very nice. If you could stay enlarged and still be mounted to your horse, that would be very, very nice. But you can't, unfortunately. Uh, so, that's the next level. Oh, oh, I forgot to talk about the vivisectionist, or the uh, alchemist, I mean. Why we are picking this up. So, the vivisectionist gets a couple of bonuses. First of all, it gets sneak attack, since we are using a mounted, uh, since we're using a mount, we will always be flanking our opponent, which means we will always deal an extra sneak attack damage. Sneak attack applies when our opponent is denied their dexterity bonus, such as, of course, when they're flanked. So we're going to get one d6 extra damage, and that d6, of course, can then get multiplied by two when we charge, because we have double charge damage. So it's very, very good. We also get the Mutagen. Mutagen gives a plus four alchemical bonus, which means it stacks with the enhancement bonus that you get from equipment and spells and stuff like that. Most spells are enhancement bonuses. Uh, that bonus, of course, is always going to be strength, because of course the higher strength you have, uh, the more likely you're to hit, the more damage you're going to deal, everything is good with strength. We are going to suffer a minus two penalty to intelligence, which is unfortunate, because of course our spell casting is based on intelligence, but on the other hand it does not matter, because uh, our intelligence is so high that we will not go below the required intelligence to cast our spells, and also um, all the spells that we cast don't affect opponents, we want to affect the DC role. It will only, uh, we will always succeed when we cast spells on ourselves, as long as we don't have, uh, as long as we don't suffer, what's called, uh, arcane spell player, as one might say. So that's the new to them, very very good. And then of course also we get spells. So we get essentially everything from Alchemist to Vivisectionist. Normal Alchemists can also cast bombs, but the Vivisectionist skips their bombs and instead gets Sneak Attack die. Which is very very good. We want to have as many Sneak Attack die as possible for this build. So what we're going for with this build is of course, we want to vary our damage since there are enemies which are immune to different things. So there are for instance enemies which are immune to Sneak Attack damage. Uh, so we even, we can't go all in on sneak attack damage. It's nice to have a couple of sneak attack dice, because that's gonna add dice in most cases, but we can't rely on it. Can have all, we can't have all the damage bound up in sneak attack, because then when we fight against something which is immune to sneak attack, it's not gonna be that good. Uh, next up, we're going with Blood Rager, and that's also because that's a lot of damage, and also because it's a little bit bugged right now. So. If you're watching this in the future, and they've patched the game, I would much recommend that you go Mixed Blood Rager, when you go Blood Rider, because these, of course, can select their bloodline. They have that as a unique feat. A, so the Blood Rager bloodlines are different from the Sorcerer's bloodlines, but they're, I mean, they're similar in name, but they're very different in function, what they do. There are a couple of uh, variants you can go with. My two recommendations would be either Mixed Blood Rager or Blood Rider for this build. As I said, if you're watching this in the future and they patched it, Mixed Blood Rager uh, is what I would go with. Uh, but right now, when the game is bugged, I would definitely recommend you go Blood Rider. And I'm gonna show you in just one second why that is. So Blood Riders, why are we going with these? Well, Blood Rider is very similar to Barbarian, except 
that the Blood Rager gets uh, something called Blood Rage instead of Rage. It's almost exactly the similar, uh, uh, exactly the same as Rage. You get to do this for a number of rounds equal to 4 plus our Constitution modifier, which is why we added a little bit of Constitution. And for that duration, we get a plus 2 bonus on melee attack rolls, damage rolls, uh, and will saving throws. Which is a nice added bonus, I guess. But uh, we also get a minus 2 penalty to armor class, which doesn't matter, of course, because it doesn't apply to our mount, and our mount is going to take all the damage essentially so we are not gonna take any damage so it doesn't matter if we get very very bad ac on this character all we need is just deal all the damage with this character so that's why we pick on blood rider for that extra damage boost uh, we also get since we are selecting blood rider a extra speed on our charge which can be nice from time to time we don't need to have fast movement which is the default thing that you get on your blood raiders because of course we're always gonna be mounted with our characters so, that's why we're selecting Blood Rider, and we go and click out the feats. And as I said, it's not super important. You can uh, go a little bit with what you need for your party here. Depends on your party composition, what you go with for skills here. For feats, since this is our level 3, we're gonna pick up, let's see here, Power Attack. So, Power Attack is going to give us a minus 1 penalty on melee attack rolls, but if you remember, we're always going to be using True Strikes, which is gonna give us a plus 20. Which means we're essentially always going to hit, and we are all in on our charge damage. Um, so that's why we're picking this up. We get a plus two bonus on all the melee damage rolls, and of course that damage roll is going to get doubled because we're charging and everything uh, because of spirited charge. This bonus damage is increased by half, so plus three if you're making an attack with a two-handed weapon, which is what I recommend you do. I recommend that you pick up a scythe. You're going to be able to pick up, pick them up very, very early in the game. Mastercrafted sites. Then, right now, the Draconic Black Bloodline is better than any other Bloodline because it's bugged. For some reason now, on level 1 in the Draconic Black Bloodline, you get Ascension, which should belong to the Celestial Bloodline level 20, but you get that on level 1 Draconic Bloodline. Of course, this gives immunity to Acid, Cold, and Petrification, which is very, very good, especially when you get to fight the Vescavores, which you don't need to do in the very, very early game, but a little bit later on in the game. Uh, you get resistance 10 to electricity and fire, very very good for the early game to get that plus 10 resistance to fire, which means that all these uh, guys throwing bombs at you are not going to deal that much damage, they're probably not going to one-shot you at least, so that's very good. As well as a plus 4 racial bonus on saving throws against poison, so that's why we're picking up the Dragonic, Draconic Bloodline Black. Also, I tried out the Celestial Bloodline, but right now this seems to be bugged. It's supposed to give you a d6 extra damage versus evil creatures. But it doesn't right now, so since everything's bugged, this seems to be the best option. In the future, that might change though. Uh, so, that's going to be the character. If you continue this to level 4, there are a couple of options. I'm just going to show you quickly uh, what I would consider selecting here. I would consider continuing with the vivisectionist in that case. Add strength, of course. You're going to go strength every level with this. Uh, add skills is not that important. And for the medical discovery, what I would go for at this point is probably the Arcane Strike. The reason we're picking up Arcane Strike is by this point should be about the point where you start um, encountering shadows and things which require you to have a magical weapon. And of course with Arcane Strike, you can spend a swift action each round to imbue your weapon with a fraction of power. For one round, your weapon deals plus one damage and is treated as magic for the purpose of overcoming damage reduction. It seems like it's very annoying that you need to click this every round, but you don't need to click this every round. Uh, if you just, it's just a toggleable ability which gives you plus one damage and it makes you overcome damage reduction where you need to have a magic weapon. So that's quite good. You can select another spell, doesn't really matter what you select here. And that is going to be it for the character, but let's also have a quick look at the animal companion. So, if you're going with a damper, as we did in this particular case, I'm going to recommend that you go Death Touch, of course, because you want to have, essentially, if you start going damper with your party, you want everybody to be a damper, so that everybody's healed and damaged by the same thing. If you don't have a damper, you don't want anybody to be a damper, essentially, because it makes it, at least for me, I think it's a little bit complicated to try to separate these groups and um, know what person takes what damage and stuff like that. But if you're into that, of course, feel free to mix and match, absolutely. Uh, so I'm gonna go with Death Touch. Other good choices are, of course, Bulwark. If you're playing this on maybe easier difficulties, you could also go with Aggressor. 
so we're gonna add perception and stealth. The I don't know exactly how much the stealth modifier is going to affect your actual performance with stealth uh, in the game. But I know that perception is very important. So the most important part here is that you pick up perception. Perception you want to have on every character. You can, at least every animal companion should have perception. Uh, because of course every character gets a perception roll for every item, for every hidden thing in the game. Every character gets one perception roll. So the more perception rolls or high perception characters you have in your party, the more likely you are to find hidden stashes, hidden treasures, switches, and so on. So that's where we're going with that. Next up, we're going with feet. This is always going to be level 1 die hard, uh, if you're playing on unfair difficulty. This means that when the animal companion would die, instead of dying, it lives on for one more round, which means that if you can heal it up again, so it doesn't die. Uh, on unfair difficulty though, you will probably be dealt so much damage that you can't do that, but at least the character that is mounted on this animal companion won't fall off as they would uh, do otherwise, if you didn't have die hard. So always die hard. Uh, name is gonna be something random, complete, and we're just gonna go through the last levels of the animal companion and see if there's anything interesting to talk about. And level up there, and level up here, and we get to select another feet. For feet you are pretty much free to do whatever you want, actually. I would recommend iron go either going Iron Will, uh, it's not really that needed in the early game, but it's going to be better later on when a lot of things start uh, using mind controls and stuff like that. Mind controlling effects is very good to have a high will save so that your mount doesn't run away. Because if your mount runs away or does something bad, <laughs> if, if they run away essentially, and or don't do what you want them to do, then the character that is mounted on it will also not do anything. So it's kind of them getting a two for one if they mind control your horse or something like that. So. Uh, I do recommend Iron Will, but you can also go with Toughness, another good selection there uh, for Unfair Difficulty. So that will be it, everybody. That is my guide for the... Where is it? Vivisectionist Sohei Bloodrider. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. See you next time.